Why is it that when the LDS want to talk about polygamy, they just can't seem to tell the truth about it? Next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? There's a series of little books that the LDS are publishing entitled, Let's Talk About Blank. Now, the blank <laughs> is whatever topic they're going to write the book about. The plan seems to be an open and honest discussion about some tough ideas that the LDS believe. Now, the second book in this little series is entitled, Let's Talk About Polygamy by Brittany Chapman Nash. And this was written by a woman, of course, and, and she studies Mormonism from a woman's viewpoint. Mm. And we want to read the description of the book, uh, how it describes itself, uh, from, I think it's the back cover. Back cover. The Let's Talk About series includes small, approachable books on important Latter-day Saint topics. Each one is written by a trusted, faithful scholar who thoroughly explains the topic, including key issues to consider. Designed for people who have sincere questions and are seeking answers, this series provides access to some of the best thinking in the church. I coughed when I read that statement <laughs> because some of their best thinking, <laughs> unfortunately, omits most of the most important details, of the, yeah. at least in this particular topic, they did. Uh, I guess they must want polygamy to be approachable. Uh, and this little book tries very hard to make a silk purse out of a cow's ear, but it just can't be done. We find this explanation about it on the inside flap. Though some aspects of the practice of polygamy may never be fully understood, the examples of sacrifice, conviction, and commitment to the gospel from the saints who practiced it may help readers find understanding and reconciliation and ultimately strengthen their own faith. So the purpose, we read from this, is to strengthen the faith of today's LDS yes. who may be questioning or doubting because of their polygamous heritage and history. Mm -hmm. Now, this is just another attempt by the LDS of putting their finger in the dike, I think, you know, to stop the massive flow of exiting Mormons who are offended at Mormonism's historical polygamy and their continued right. cover-up or yeah. lying about it. Again, we have to wonder why today's uh, Mormons love their polygamist heritage, but they are so offended by today's polygamous people. You know, the author explains some of the reasons they are so enamored by their polygamist uh, foundation. And from the preface, preface, we read this. And I'm going to have to apologize because as I, I even read this uh, before, um, I just have a sarcasm to my tone, I'm afraid, <laughs> and it, it, I hope it doesn't come out quite well, that way. Well, Earl, you know, I, I think that it causes sarcasm when you've come from their brainwashing and manipulative information, that, the way they give us information, and we know that they're not telling the truth. Yeah, I, we know I, they're not. Well, it's just not being totally forthcoming. Right. I think they call that gaslighting right. or something. Right. But yeah, gaslighting is a good word. I learned what it meant to trust in God through the hard things. Is that where we're at? I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I moved That's my it. finger yeah. a little. I, I learned what it meant to trust in God through the hard things. The sacrifices they willingly made because of religious convictions moved me, and their commitment to the restored gospel ultimately served to strengthen my own faith. Is that where we were at? That's right. And again, right. It, she mentions how, how important it is to strengthen their own faith. So they use and say things certain ways to strengthen the faith of the members. Yeah, and she further says, The practice of polygamy in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was a battleground where faith, culture, and commandment collided. To, to opponents, it was a rock that needed blowing up with the dynamic of law. To its adherents, it was the word and will of God. And, and, you know, truthfully, when we're talking about the truth of all of this, the entire argument through the decades of Mormonism and polygamy falls apart right here because polygamy was not and it never was the word and will of God. 
They said it was, yeah. but biblical scriptures do not support that statement. She writes on page two that this little book, and this is the little book we brought it here, uh, and it's just kind of like a little pamphlet. Yeah. You know, it's not very long, but it was long enough to give me some sarcasm. <laughs> um, but she writes that this little book on page two will address the hard questions in a concise and, and accessible way, telling the story of polygamy from the perspective of those who practiced it. But she's not doing it. She's doing it from her perspective. Mm -hmm. Obviously, she herself was never a polygamist. The true story of life in polygamy needs to be told from the perspective of a person who's lived through its horrors and the women, women who were forced to share their husbands. That's where it needs to be written <laughs> from. Right. It's odd that the LDS people who want to honor their ancestors' polygamy won't leave it themselves. And, and they conveniently avoid and ignore the negative comments that historical polygamous wives have made during those early years of Mormon polygamy. She repeatedly points out that polygamy, just like monogamy, was imperfect because the people were imperfect. I hear this frequently, you know, yeah. from, from different people. Right. But they must want us to believe that polygamy was honorable and, and that, that the tragedies because of polygamy were acceptable simply because imperfect people lived it. And that's a fraud. <laughs> the imperfections of humans are without question. But that does not justify the horrible experiences and the heretical doctrines that polygamy itself has caused in the lives and hearts of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women and children. Now, we want to repeat over and over again, polygamy was not commanded by God ever. It wasn't commanded to Abraham or Jacob or David or Solomon or Joseph Smith. It was never commanded by God to any plural wife or to any prophet leader of today's polygamy groups. God prohibited polygamy. He did not command it. This fact alone completely nullifies every single justification in this little book. And, and that's what they aim to do is justify it. Because going against God's, God's will is never justified. Mm. In her attempt to justify polygamy, she writes this on page four. Without faith in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, the practice of plural marriage would not have taken root. Although our understanding of polygamy may, may never be perfect, respecting the early saints' faith in this principle gives grace to the whole picture. No, it doesn't. <laughs> There's no grace in polygamy, period. Uh, and we don't place our faith in something. We place our faith in a person, Jesus alone. And Jesus said that God instituted monogamy and that there are no marriages after this life. Either we trust what Jesus said or we don't. And those who don't trust what Jesus said are lost souls. She also wrote that that, that yeah. faith is supposed to be the restored gospel. Uh, of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Again, nullifying what Jesus said in Mark 13. Yeah, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So either Jesus was right or we needed a restored gospel, right? Because yeah, <laughs> right. both of them can be true. And, and, so this, and, and the so-called restored gospel included polygamy. But the gospel of Jesus Christ never included polygamy. He never taught it. Nope. So there's so much in this book uh, that sounds smooth and conciliatory as it explains the harshness of polygamy. But smooth words will never equal truth. We obviously can't point out every error in the book. So we're just going to, you know, point on some highlights, hoping with prayers uh, that the polygamous people and the LDS people will, who, who do trust Joseph Smith will... Uh, transfer that trust to Jesus alone. And when you honestly compare what Mormonism embraces with what the Bible teaches, you'll wonder, what was Joseph Smith up to anyway, and how did he get by with it? Now, many times Jesus said, watch out, do not be deceived. Don't believe what people tell you the Bible says. Study it for yourself and find out for yourself what it says. It's up to each individual to be sure you are not deceived. And we'll never be able to blame someone else's error for our error. Never. Because we lack diligence. So let's quote from her book. 
As early as 1831, when Joseph Smith inquired of the Lord for a more perfect understanding of marriage, Joseph's resulting revelation endowed marriage with eternal creative purpose and established marital matrimony as essential to God's eternal plan for humankind, and received revelation from the Lord that polygamy would be reinstated in the future. Eternal marriage is the foundational doctrine upon which plural marriage was built, but eternal marriage exists independently of plural marriage in the form of monogamy, making plural marriage only a component of the larger, more comprehensive principle of eternal marriage. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> the truth is eternal marriage was never a doctrine until Joseph Smith came up with polygamy. Yep. In fact, that's that's when he invented eternal marriage. That's what polygamy was, was eternal, was eternal marriage, marriage yeah. celestial marriage. They've redefined that now, but that's what it was in the days of Joseph Smith. Now, it's interesting that their gospel of eternal marriage and polygamy doesn't include Jesus. Their Savior isn't Jesus. It's just a stepping stone. As she said so. You read it. Marriage, family, sealing covenants, sealing ceremonies, polygamy, endowments, genealogy, all of these things and more complete the salvation of Mormonism. They've marginalized Jesus. They've set him aside. She wrote in the previous quote, quote that the Lord told Joseph Smith he would reinstitute polygamy. But something that never was instituted can be reinstituted. God instituted monogamy, not polygamy. And you can find that out just by reading Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And Jesus said so as well. Many times over, she writes that the importance of eternal marriage and uh, she writes about the importance of eternal marriage and the sealing ceremonies and ordinances and the rituals that unite saints together for eternity, that, that family is the foundation of heavenly life and so on, that these are the core of Mormon exaltation. Yet every single one of these practices are false and exclude Jesus. Yeah. Nowhere in all of biblical scripture can you find those doctrines. You can't even find him in the Book of Mormon, actually. And Jesus said that his words would never pass away. There was no need for a Mormon restoration. She writes about the secrecy in which Joseph Smith introduced polygamy. Mm -hmm. Joseph understood that polygamy would be extremely controversial and that introducing it was a radical, even dangerous undertaking. Thus, Joseph introduced the practice of polygamy secretly and gradually in Nauvoo between 1841 and 1844, quietly building support for the practice among close, trusted church members, he proceeded with caution. (laughs) Yes, he did. (laughs) These are old arguments, uh, and they've been debunked many times over. First of all, Jesus taught nothing in secret, so why should Joseph Smith? In Luke 8, 17 and 18, it says, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, take heed how you hear. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> and Luke eleven thirty three says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. And John 18:20, uh, we we read, Jesus answered him, "I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing." But Joseph Smith <laughs> gets to do his shenanigans in secret. Next, his own articles of faith. Yeah. That Mormonism obeys the laws of the of the land, yet everywhere they lived, <laughs> polygamy was illegal. Smith did it secretly, simply because it was not acceptable or legal for him to do it. And, and and also, if polygamy was required, then Joseph Smith did a great disservice by keeping it secret. That's true. Right, and it was not a calling. As, as some LDS people today choose to call polygamy, all of the early Mormon presidents and prophets preached over and over again that polygamy was required for eternal life. Section 132 says that. Does, does she mention any of this in the book? <laughs> Do she know? doesn't. I did not read where she mentioned the calling, but I've heard right. it from other people right. that it was a calling and only a few oh, people no, lived for it. Oh, no, sure. Yeah. Um, Now, she briefly mentions in the book how difficult it was for Emma to accept Joseph Smith's polygamy. So my question is, (laughs) why didn't God reveal the polygamy commandment to Emma? 
If Emma had to be involved in it, then she should have been informed of it by God himself. Now, in the Bible, uh, when, when God wanted a woman to know something, he told her. He didn't tell it through somebody else. He told Rebecca about her twins, not Isaac. He told Samson's mother first that she was going to get pregnant. She didn't tell Samson's husband or her, her husband. He told Hannah first, if you read in, in first, Sa yeah. first Samuel chapter 1. He told Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, first, not the husband. He told, oh, maybe she, he did hear that one first in the temple. We'll neglect that one. But he told Mary, Mary. the mother of Jesus, yeah. uh, that she would be become pregnant even as a virgin before he ever told Joseph. So, so God can tell the woman <laughs> if she's going to be involved in a plan like that. There's only one mediator between the individual and God, and that mediator is Jesus, not Joseph Smith. Yeah, First Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Okay, so there you are. It's not Joseph Smith. Or a woman's husband, by the way, <laughs> which Mormonism, especially polygamy, polygamy, the woman's husband is the mediator. Yeah. Now, on page 84, <clears throat> regarding marriage relationships, she writes this heartbreaking falsehood. The feelings of polygamous husbands and wives often mirrored those of monogamists. They yearned for unity, <clears throat> companionship, and love, and felt the pain of betrayal frustration and heartache, even as their situations were riddled with circumstances unique to plural unions. These circumstances, including navigating complicated layers of family diplomacy, living independently of one's spouse, welcoming new wives into the family, and ultimately cultivating the love which, despite obstacles, bound many couples together. She's using a lot of words <clears throat> to not really say very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. But she's admitting that they yearned for something monogamous alone enjoyed. Yeah. Unity, companionship, and love. But instead, polygamists experience the pain of betrayal, frustration, and heartache. And they, what's amazing is they think this comes from God. Well, she called it complicated layers of family diplomacy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Living yeah. independently of one's wo spouse. Mm -hmm. that, that didn't mean abandonment. Mm -hmm. Welcoming new wives into the family and ultimately, ultimately cultivating the love that binds them together. Ultimately, so. how far, how much time is involved in that <laughs> word, ultimately? Um, but then God, God doesn't do this kind of thing. Yeah. God is a God of love. How would he ever put together something like this to reflect his love. There's one comment I do want to, yeah. that you mentioned that I want right. to point out where she mentions the complications of plural marriage uh, suffer. And she said, and I quote, welcoming new wives into the family. Well, <clears throat> I wonder if she read the stories that contemporary and pioneer polygamous wives have written about their lives in polygamy, their painful experiences of being forced to accept new wives into the family. Why deliberately make polygamy look so loving and acceptable? It wasn't. She's ignoring dozens of historical accounts from the experiences of plural wives themselves. The first wife dreaded and hated the idea of another wife being brought into her home. It was not a welcoming event. One wife was so distressed, she went outside to hide her pain on a wintry night and froze to death. Hmm. History shows that others hid their pain and distress. Some went crazy in the process and had to be placed in an asylum. Others lived with silent pain all of their married lives, and there was a shocking number of divorces. <laughs> What's eternal about that? Right. What love is this? <laughs> The God of the Bible instituted monogamy, not polygamy. Now, she briefly discusses the polyandry of Joseph Smith. And it, again, this is where my sarcasm might come through. Um, she, she talks about it where he married already married women, and she glosses over it, suggesting a motive that could almost be pure and holy and righteous. <laughs> but adultery can never be considered the right thing to do. And she incorrectly says that Joseph Smith was the only man 
who indulged in polyandry. Yet historical accounts show that Brigham Young did. Parley Pratt was shot and killed because he took another man's wife as a plural wife and her husband killed him. There's no doubt that other men took women besides just these two that were already, or three that were already married and didn't bother getting legal divorces. She calls Smith's polyandry puzzle, puzzling. Yes. God calls it adultery. We quote from page 16. <clears throat> Indeed, of Joseph's first 12 plural sealings, nine were to women who were legally married. Virtually all of the married women continued to live and have children with their legal husbands after their marriages to Joseph. These plural marriages may have been for eternity alone because no reliable sources have been found that confirm sexual relations. Joseph Smith is the only person known to have engaged in polyandrous Ceilings. That is a blatant lie, <laughs> if she read any history, that is. That's right. Um, and again, um, for instance, Zena Huntington, we're going to talk about her in a minute, uh, that was a sexual relationship. Sure. And, and others, women, other wives, affirmed that, that Joseph Smith went to bed with them and had sex. They were wife indeed, they said. So she's, she's either totally uninformed or she's blatantly uh, deciding not to tell the truth here. She whitewashes Joseph Smith's adulterous marriage to Zena Huntington, which is probably the most tragic of all of Joseph Smith's polygamy. <clears throat> and historical show, uh, sources show that Brigham Young also took Zena as a plural wife after Smith was dead. And Brigham kicked out her legal husband, and then he took Zena as a plural wife, and he had children with her. And they never, Zena and her legal husband were never divorced. So how can she disregard historical truth? Uh, probably because it's so ugly and the LDS must whitewash their image. And she probably knows they'll never check it out. They'll just believe what they read. Well, and if she wrote it in here, she'd probably, they probably wouldn't have produced it. <laughs> well, I'm sure she had some people had going over her text oh, to... I'm sure. to uh, <laughs> to approve it, <laughs> yeah, make the words sound right. So we now we go to page seventy-three, where she categorizes polygamy into a high status for women, and gives the woman expanded opportunities. We quote <laughs> expanded opportunity <laughs> for a woman who desired to marry. Plural marriage expanded her opportunities to find a husband. Church leaders, as well as the Latter-day Saint women, claimed that polygamy elevated the status of women ensuring that they had the opportunity to become honored wives and mothers with homes of their own and social position. There was, and still is today, a general perception that righteous women outnumber righteous men and that more women will qualify for celestial glory than men. Some have suggested that this numerical inequality was an explanation for why plural marriage was instituted. <laughs> Did you hear my teeth gritting? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, uh, re religious adultery does expand opportunities for both the man and the woman, and for a woman to find a mate if she can marry a married man. But that wasn't ever God's design. The birth ratio of male and female is almost equal, and if God designed polygamy, he, have, he would have created more me females for this world than males, but he didn't. He said, one man and one woman makes a marriage. Now, she notes later that the idea that there were more righteous women than men is not scripturally supported. But then she adds this. Because eternal marriage is essential to exaltation, Latter-day Saint women often choose, chose to marry men, married or single, who were worthy to enter temples to be sealed. Thus, some couples prioritized righteousness or worthiness over romantic love. We say hogwash <laughs> to that. Originally, oh boy. <laughs> originally, eternal marriage and polygamy were the same thing. Only Jesus is essential to exaltation. Nothing in the temple will affect salvation. And Jesus warned that whoever exalts himself will be abased. And eternal life is, is in and by and through Jesus Christ alone. Marriage has nothing to do with it. Biblical scripture teaches nothing about our ability to make ourselves worthy because we can't. We're all sinners and sinners cannot be made righteous through marriage. 
Again, we point out they've taken Jesus out of the salvation requirement and have placed marriage and temple worthiness and their ritual of sealing people to people as being the road to eternal life. <clears throat> and that's a false teaching in a <laughs> false religion. Yeah, it is. She also said in the last quote that LDS leaders and some women considered polygamy as elevating the status of women. Now, we must point out to her <laughs> and to our viewers, to books written to women who were there and who saw it and who lived it and who condemned it and who raised awareness of polygamy to people outside of Utah and waged campaigns against polygamy in order to obliterate it. Books like, yeah. do you want to read those Oh, books? I sure will. Anna Eliza Young's story in Wife Number 19, which we covered just last week, mm -hmm. I believe. Just last time, yeah. Fanny Stenhouse's story in Tell It All, Women of Mormonism Told by the Women Themselves, edited by Jeannie Anderson Froiseth, mm. Ex Expose of Polygamy in Utah by Mrs. T.B.H. Stenhouse, and Naked Truths About Mormonism by Arthur B. Deming. And, and there's many, many, many other books that are written um, about the time polygamy raged in early Mormonism and today. People were there. They saw it, they lived it, and they left it. Now, of course, LDS leaders would brainwash women to make them believe that their status as a secondary wife was a good place to be. Of course they would. The first seven presidents of the Ch Mormon church were polygamous, and there's a lot more in her book that we could quote and comment on. Much of it's redundant. Some of it's designed to bring soft, fluffy feelings yeah. to the reader, but fluffiness is not a measure of truth. We do say that this book is really just more brainwashing, more whitewashing, and more glossing over the ugliness and the tragedy of early Mormon pioneer patriarchal polygamy and confirms once again that Mormonism is all about themselves and is a total rejection of the biblical Jesus who is the only savior. We need no one and we need nothing in addition to Jesus for our eternal life and celestial glory. In closing, we have one last quote which is taken from the preface of her book. Although it may be difficult to understand why Latter-day Saints elected to live polygamously, polygamously, perhaps we can come to respect their point of view as we learn their stories. Well, I'm sorry, but we cannot respect their view when they live in opposition to what Jesus taught. LDS apologists and polygamous leaders hide behind the phrase, God commanded Joseph Smith. But God doesn't command something he prohibits. God did not command Joseph Smith or anyone else to take multiple wives ever. So that was a very quick review of this book that raised a lot of blood pressure, I think, and maybe when I went through it. <laughs> well, I think any time we read these apologists, they just leave out so much and not cover the details that uh, really are so negative right, and they just right. fail to really tell the whole truth. And they never answer the question, where in the Bible has God commanded it? Yeah. You know, they bring examples of Bible polygamy in the Bible, yeah. but they never show where God gave the commandment. And I'm sure she didn't mention when she was mentioning 1831 that uh, uh, Oliver Cowdery said what a Nasty, a dirty, dirty rotten, affair nasty affair that that was. <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't included in the book. I didn't see it. No, I didn't not. see it. No, and I'm sure she wouldn't have. Yeah, Thank you, Earl. That. Appreciate yeah, your. You know, First Corinthians seven two says, "Let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband." Now, with scriptures like this, we can know that God would not contradict Himself by commanding polygamy. Nearly every every belief and practice and, and ritual of Mormonism either discounts Jesus and His exclusive and powerful work as Savior, or completely ignores Him. Even their plan of salvation focuses on themselves and their works rather than on Jesus. They claim to be Christian, but their Mormon scriptures, their doctrine and organization are not Christian. They say they are the only way to God, but Jesus is the only way to God. Don't risk your eternity on someone else's claim of truth. It just isn't worth it. Thank you for watching. <laughs>